Hello, friends. Welcome to episode 1472 of the Lawton Hawks podcast. I am your host, Brad Roland, coming to you on a Sunday evening into Monday. And thank you for joining us, as always, on the podcast and making us your first listen each and every day. Check us out and subscribe anywhere you get your podcasts, whether it be Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, etc. And today's show is also brought to you by the good folks at Prize Picks. If you're a first time user, get 100% instant deposit match up to $100 with promo code locked on. That is prizepicks.com, promo code locked on. And I'm joined on today's episode and for several in the future, it seems, by Glenn Willis of ATL and 29 and Peachtree Hoops. Glenn is fantastic covering the Hawks, X's and O's and all that fun stuff. And last year, we did a series together, basically breaking down all of the relevant players on the Hawks roster in capsule form. Kind of a recap of last year, what's to come, roles, all that sort of nuance, interesting stuff. And this year, what we're going to do is get into the top 10 guys in deep dive fashion, because there's a pretty clear dividing line between the top 10 and everybody else. But on this first edition... What Glenn and I did was talk about all the supporting pieces on the roster this year. Uh, in short, that covers Trent Forrest and Aaron Holiday, Bruno Fernando, Garrison Matthews, Donovan Williams, V. Krejci, and Tyrese Martin. We plan to be a little bit short on this one. Of course, we got going as Glenn and I always get going in a little bit of uh, deep dive fashion. So it's a full episode. I hope you enjoy to start your week. Without further delay, again, one more time, please subscribe to the podcast. But without further delay, the intro will come, and then I'll be joined by Glenn Willis to talk about all the supporting pieces on the Hawks roster. You are Locked On Hawks, your daily Atlanta Hawks podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I am joined once again by my friend Glenn Willis at ATL and 29 and all things internet about the Atlanta Hawks. Glenn, welcome back. And uh, first of all, at the top of the podcast, I want to appreciate you for doing this because, uh, as we'll talk about in a second, it's going to be maybe a multi part uh, series of uh, player evaluations, things like that. So, thank you for all the time that you are uh, generously gifting me uh, beginning today. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. And, and t- for me, like, as frustrating as the season was, this is probably one of the most fun off seasons looking ahead. They have a mix of kind of veteran a veteran group they have to make some decisions around which is interesting and some young guys that are uh, encouraging and that's a that's a nice mix to make for some interesting conversations so happy to be a part of it definitely and uh, you know you and i talked in uh, more broad strokes i don't know a week ago as well as people listening to this podcast uh sort of a two-part not a full like retrospective but certainly a little bit of uh, what happened in the playoffs and what happened during the season and look ahead and uh, we did this last year, so if you are an everyday listener, I do appreciate everyone that is that way. But if you're new, what we're going to do over however long this is going to take us, um, maybe interspersed with other episodes and things like that, is basically talk about uh, the 10 key guys on the Hawks roster that are under contract for next season. So we'll do a little bit on the guys who are not in that group. Your Aaron Holiday's Trent Forrest here in a second. But I think basically it's pretty simple. It's kind of a round number, which makes it funny. But the Hawks have their 10 guys. They had the nine that played in the playoffs and then A.J. Griffin – they're under contract. It's pretty clearly their core tenant at this point in time. So what we're going to do is talk about like how they played this last season, kind of what they are, maybe a little bit, a little bit of a look, look ahead on these guys, especially the younger guys as well. But uh, we did it last year. It went pretty well. People liked it. So I, I figured we would uh, run it back. And it's a good way to kind of just get a little bit deeper on these guys because, you know, no matter what, and, you know, I could talk to Tyler for two hours or talk to you for an hour and a half on this podcast. And we're not going to do enough on every single guy. I always get like somebody, you know, talk about this guy. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll do one episode here uh, sort of on every single guy. Talk about like what they're doing at this point in time. And I'm sure you and I especially will leave me on the bone still. There'll be, there'll be stuff that we, that we don't get to because it's not going to be, it can't be, it, can, it cannot possibly be comprehensive when there's this much to talk about. But uh, that's what we're doing. That's the, that's the plan anyway. Sounds good. Yeah, let's, let's step in. <laughs> we'll dive in. Uh, again, I said this a second ago, but we'll do a little bit of a brief overview on the guys who we're not going to do like full or deep dives on. I grouped them kind of a little bit. Uh, basically, there's the Aaron Holiday, Trent Forrest group, and those guys are the only free agents, actually, technically on the roster. Uh, Aaron is uh, was on a one-year deal, vet minimum. Trent Forrest on a two-way, it was only a one year. So those guys are actually going to be expiring and if the Hawks wanted to, and we don't know if they do or not, but if they wanted to, they could they could just bring everybody back other than these two guys unilaterally. They have them on their contract. And it was also interesting to me that, you know, Aaron and Trent are kind of similar. Not They're not exactly the same player, but they're the point of attack defenders. And they're the guys who were, you know, Aaron played more than Trent did. But I wonder what you make of uh, with those guys, because, you know, they, they could bring them back. Either one of them realistically it wouldn't stun me, but they're not under contract. And they're pretty, uh, they're kind of, the, not, not, they're not the same player, but they're uh, fun 
in a similar fashion. I think. Yeah, um, yeah, one can shoot, right? So that, that's, <laughs> yeah, that's Aaron, and that's, and that's Aaron. I was gonna say yes. <laughs> right, and the trade off you get is Forrest has more size on defense, which really makes it makes a difference. So that's kind of your. Your, your difference there. Okay, we're done. No, I'm kidding. Um, I mean, kind of. Honestly, that's. I mean, they're, <laughs> you know, and I would also say that Trent's maybe uh maybe better ball handler, maybe better like a creator. That I mean, kind of a low bar. Uh, but yep. you know, they kind of they kind of let Trent do some point guard stuff for a while this year. He also played some wing. I don't know. This is interesting. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he he had some flashes with, with like second unit kind of time yeah. where he. Uh, in games where like they were stuck, you know, with that group, and he created some shots that they're getting to the rim and some things like that. He's um, he kind of picks the spots in transition here and there as well. So, you know, from that standpoint, you know, it, it's he feels like a guy who's always going to have maybe kind of one foot kind of you know in I don't want to say in the league, but kind of uh, knocking on the door of, of trying to kind of become a guy who can kind of get into the rotation and a guy who's probably going to be on a average team or so kind of throughout the season in and out and in and out, depending on injuries, matchups, you know, all sorts of things like that. I don't know that he's ever going to persist as a, you know, full-time kind of rotation player uh, anywhere. Um, but the ball handling is great. The size on defense is great. Um, and he, um, you know, really stood out in the roster they had this last season as a guy who can uh, function at the point of attack, you know, and do better than average, quite a bit better than average, you know, apart from like, when he's guarding the elite guys. So he, you know, he, he's, uh, he, he's in the kind of in the Brad Roland template, you know, of guys <laughs> who can kind of really bring the defense and, and find his spots, hopefully on offense and kind of generate that kind of value. And those, those guys are valuable to have around, you know, they're, they're not guys you're going to probably ever put on more than a one year deal, maybe never more than a, a, a vet minimum or depending upon what, which player and where they are in their you know career and things like that, uh, what kind of minimum and things like that. But, you know, you could do a lot worse for a guy who's your 13th or 14th guy than the Trent Forrest. He has skills, he has size, and he has defensive value, and that, that's 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 all some worthwhile stuff to have around. Yeah, my short version on Trent is that I think Trent's an NBA player. I, I don't think that at current uh, that he would be someone that you want in the rotation every night on most teams, at least on good teams. The shooting is a, is a real limitation. It, it, it is, and I, I think everybody knows it. But the fact that he does have real size, you know, he's six three, six four, and can play a little bit off the ball. He's a good cutter. We saw that when he was forcing into the action we talked about earlier. Like he knows he can't shoot. It's one of those things where like he he knows the things that you have to do if you can't shoot, especially if you're that size. Like he's an active cutter. He rebounds. He'll dive to the rim and kind of just be out of the way. He's a good spacer for someone who can't shoot. He, he kind of knows that you can't bunch things up and defensively you like him and also by all accounts a great guy behind the scenes like just a good culture guy um they, they liked him in utah they liked him in atlanta so um i don't know if he'll be back i mean if i'm i would agree with what you said um, maybe like a one-year vet minimum kind of deal um two ways you know two ways are difficult he's already been on i think he, i'm not even sure if he's eligible, eligible for another two-way but um regardless I, I think he is like a 13th 14th man like you said right now not, not a guy that you would be in the plans but for deaf purposes you could do worse and then aaron you know, I, I know that he was the source of frustration for some Hawks fans at times, uh, you know, especially when Justin was around, too. It was kind of a lot of a lot of uh, grenades lobbed at the Holiday Brothers during the season from from fans. But I think Aaron on a vet minimum went the way that it was supposed to go. I mean, he, he's a he's a limited player, but he was signed for the one year vet minimum. And he's a same kind of thing. He's a, he's a really good 11th, 12th man to have in your roster. Um, we all wish he, he could run an offense or that he was if, if he was six, three, he'd be fantastic. He's just. He's five eleven instead of six three. So uh, that's the short version. Anything else that you want to add on Aaron Holiday? Because he was going to play the most of this group. Yeah, I mean it, it's interesting because um, you know on a roster that's built around Trey, his fit becomes even a little harder, or maybe even more than a little harder yeah. um, in that in that sense. And that is hard to put him on the court with Trey for any kind of extended time if there's an injury to Dejounte or what have you. Not a guy who's probably ever going to be your your. In my mind, he's never going to be like the third guard on a good team. Um, and on an ideal roster makeup, he's kind of like your fifth guard um, that can kind of kind of give you that depth. And, you know, his his ability to shoot the ball, he can shoot the basketball. You know, he catches, shoot, spot up, you know, and things like that. But there were, there were times they kind of forced him into or chose to I or – forced him into kind of trying to create things like that. And that's just, that's just not who he is. You know, I mean, we, we, we know that it's, it's funny to me because you may have edited this, but I remember, I was strange the things that stick in your head, but I remember writing a 
um, a follow on a Pacers Hawks game, maybe, I don't know, three or four years ago when Nate was coaching Indiana. And uh, and the Pacers were trying to run Aaron Holiday pick and rolls kind of down the stretch. The Hawks won that game. And the Hawks were inviting him into whatever space he wanted to try to get, to get into around that. Just couldn't make anything happen. He couldn't measure his passes. And we saw a lot of that this year, too. He's probably a little more refined than he was a number of years ago. But you, you made the comment around Trent Forrest, like he knows he's not a shooter. That makes me think about, well, you know, how does Quinn view that? But Quinn had him in Utah, you know, yeah. on the Aaron Holiday side of things. It's he knows what he can do, you know, and if you ask him to do more, he's a good teammate. You know, he's going to step up and try to do that. But, you know, his role is, you know, fifth guard off the bench, can shoot the ball, uh, can, you know, bring some defensive intensity, you know, and things like that. And again, again, it's just a, a guy who's useful to have around. But if you're designing your roster to have a really reliable ro- rotation start to finish, he's probably just outside that, that group. Today's show is brought to you by the award-winning app at PrizePix. PrizePix is daily fantasy made easy. It's amazing. I know that you will love it as well. It is very easy to use. It went up to 25 times the money on your entries. Yes, 25 times. That's a lot of money. And they have safe and fast withdrawals of PrizePix. And every single day during the playoffs in the NBA, one PrizePix user will actually have a chance to win a million dollars. Yes, a million dollars. One entry placed after 8 a.m. Eastern time each day will be randomly selected. And whoever placed the entry will actually be given a six-pack flex with the following payouts. If you get all six correct, it's a million dollars. Five out of six, $80,000. And four out of six, $16,000. And if you want full details, you can be found at pricepicks.com slash million. You must opt in at that link to be eligible for the million-dollar entry. That's pricepicks.com slash million. And once you opt in, all you actually have to do is go to actually play the game like normal, and you can be the lucky winner at PrizePix. Download the app right now. Go to pricepicks.com to sign up and play daily fantasy sports. If you're a first-time user, get 100% instant deposit match up to $100 with promo code Locked On. Don't forget that promo code. It is promo code Locked On at sign up for the instant deposit match up to $100. Check it out now at PrizePix. And one more time, it is pricepicks.com slash million. He is a better fit. Well, I think you said at the beginning of that um, with a different team potentially that has more of a lead ball handler that's bigger. Like him and Trey is not the greatest pairing in the world. I do think that um, on some teams in some situations, he would be a perfectly fine fourth guard where he's going to play most nights. And um, it's just that when your point guard is already 6'1 and limited, um, Aaron's creation limitations hurt him because he really is not a point guard. I mean, it's, I, I, I say this lovingly, and I said it throughout the season, but for people that missed it, I call him the, the world's smallest three and D wing. Cause that's kind of what he is. I mean, it's, it's weird to say that for a guy who obviously is listed as a point guard, he's point guard size, but if you watch him for any length of time, he doesn't really run the offense. He'll do it if you ask him to, but the results are not great, but he really can. He's a knockdown shooter. I mean, it's kind of, it's kind of funny. You never see that hardly, but when he's just, it, Spotting up, he'll he'll shoot 38, 40% from three. Like he'll he'll do yeah. that. And he'll defend. He always he, I mean he's limited, he's also limited there kind of that he's so small, but he will get up into you. That's that's and he knows that. So that's kind of his pathway to playing. But again, that signing was perfectly fine. I, I will go to my grave with that. I, I'm it's not a huge not a huge deal, obviously, but it, it worked out just fine. It's just that they might want someone a little bit bigger in that role or more of a point guard or both. And uh, we'll see if that comes back. But he's a guy who should be in the league for several years. Like he's he's definitely gonna be a player more so like established than Trent because he's just done it for longer and the shooting is just a lot translatable. Um, but, you know, Aaron, I had no, I had no issues with Aaron <laughs> whatsoever. Yeah. Really. And, I mean, and he has a network, you know, with Drew and, and Justin where he's just, he's just more plugged into more people, you know, in, in the league by, by that standing. And, you know, being from LA is always a great kind of, you know, home base to have too for a guy just trying to, you know, discover every opportunity, you know, the best opportunities that are there. So he has a lot of resources uh, kind of from, from that standpoint as well um, and everything. But, but yeah, I mean, uh, it, it, you know, these two guys are, it makes me think, you know, not too far down the road here. These are the kinds of guys you see earlier versions of them at summer league, like, which is, you know, which I, I love, absolutely love. You'll see a guy who's just not quite big enough or not quite fast enough or not quite good enough shooter and you see them the second year and the third year, and you could tell they're working really hard to kind of grow their game in the areas where they have to grow their games to get a real shot, you know, and things like that. Um, but that's what that's and that's fascinating to me. But the, the you know, you, get, you have guys that are like have half of an NBA game or two thirds of an NBA game, you know, and things like that. And and that's to me some of the most fun uh, to watch. So for that reason, I have a, an affinity for guys like this in a similar way that you do. Um, but they're they're just. To me, they're fun. I don't know that a lot of fans are like that's that's just weird, Glenn. But that's, <laughs> I, I love I love those guys. I love when they do well. I love 
admiring you know how hard they work and how different their path is and all that sort of stuff so yeah i, I, I love uh, digging down those guys you're a basketball sicko which is why i appreciate you you're uh, we are kindred spirits in this regard um i, I do want to move to these guys are not so easily paired together because they're different kind of players, but they came in the same trade. So I'm going to, I'm going to pair Bruno and Garrison Matthews together um, as these guys who uh, they're on these really, these really team friendly contracts. That's one thing they were again, acquired in the same deal for, for Justin holiday. Uh, Bruno, obviously more center. Garrison Matthews is more of a shooting guard, all these things. And we can kind of go into these things, but I find them interesting in that on some teams um, they would have been rotation players. And I think that, especially Matthews has been kind of a proven rotation player for multiple, multiple years, not a guy who you're going to love or that you're going to start or anything like that, but a guy who's played rotation minutes for multiple seasons. And Bruno was starting games for the Rockets just a few months ago, like opening night was a starter for the Rockets this year. These guys are almost overqualified for the, you know, 11, 12, 13th man roles they were in when they got here, they really weren't playing. Um, And look, this is not a bad thing. And we'll get into this more as we get into all these guys, but Knock on wood, the Hawks were pretty darn healthy the last few months of the season, and that allowed these that, that allowed them to really not play. But I think if you simulated the season overall, 82 games, and had these guys on the roster, they would play a lot more minutes just because of injuries, and they're both capable of doing that. You could uh, pick whichever one you want to go with first, but that's kind of my takeaway. Is like these guys are on these really friendly contracts, and they're both very solid. Just really, uh, for Hawks fans, they didn't really get a chance to see that. I said Bruno a couple years ago, but – Bruno now is a different player than he was a couple years ago. Darius Matthews is a real NBA player. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and Bruno, I think, is a guy who is like a really good third center, you know, for you. And good good in the sense that he can function as your second center if you have foul issues, injuries, what have you. I don't think he's a guy you want to ride as your second center the whole way through an NBA season yet, like right now. I don't think he's terrible at that. I just think he I think for a team who has like serious goals. He's probably not quite at that level yet. He'll hold you back a little bit on offense. He's limited there, you know, not, not a shooter and not really going to do much with the ball. He's, he's always been like really crisp and DHO and like a pretty good decision maker around that, but that's about all he has on defense. He's become more physical and he's become a more um, focused on the presence he's generating as a defensive anchor than he was earlier in his career. And, and so, you know, to me, there's two parts of the value here with the both of these guys, and we'll talk about you know Matthews here in a second. But they're they're guys who can not embarrass you, you know, in real minutes in a real game. The other side is they're not on guaranteed contracts, so you know, so you have this flexibility, which is massively important for where the Hawks are right now entering this offseason. I think they're they're saying to themselves, if we have an opportunity to kind of make a a, a big roster move, and we need this flexibility that's what those guys have right in that flexibility. And they're not guys that are just like fake NBA players on a roster, creating this kind of financial, you know, uh, cap hole that that's flexible and they can get rid of or move or do whatever. These guys who can play with for you next year, if you want, but they, that the flexibility and them not being guaranteed is, is absolutely huge. So, you know, I, I remember after the, tra- after the trade deadline, you, you kind of poked some fun at me and Kevin for leading <laughs> the uh, next episode of 18 on 29 with the Bruno kind of vibe. And that wasn't planned. First of all, Kevin and I put basically I zero it. planning. Zero. I, planning. I, I absolutely love that. It was very, it was, it was very <laughs> it was on brand. brand and, right? yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then, hey, Garrison Matthews, I, um, I, I don't want to say I have some history with him, but he was at Lipscomb University when my daughter was there. So I actually got to see, I saw him play, you know, a number of times before he ever even became kind of an NBA prospect of those sorts of things. So it's just kind of a funny way that I, I've never, I, I don't think I've ever actually met him or anything like that. Um, it's not like he and my daughter were in the same circle circles. It's just, I, I'd be the basketball guy when I was around. Yeah. I'm like, oh, there's a game play. Let's go watch for first half or, you know, whatever that might be. But for me, like his size and his shooting is what kind of just plants him right into a nice template of a player that you can kind of see on the wing that, you know, here's a guy who can give us some depth and those sorts of things. Um, you know, he's um, a solid enough ball handler. I don't he's not the guy you're going to put into any sort of primary action and kind of get you credit creating offense, but second action, third action, I think he's good enough to, to be fine. I don't think he'll ever be good at that, but, you know, fine at that. And then the shooting, I think he's a legitimate shooter, you know, on defense, he knows how to use his size. You know, he's never going to be a, a guy who kind of moves, the way the elite defenders do and things like that. But, you know, when we get around to talking to some other guys who have their own defensive struggles, like Sadiq Bay, 
he's a guy who's got to do it as a team defender. He's got to do it as a help defender, as a guy who hustles, a guy who works hard helping rebound the basketball. That's where his kind of defensive path is, is in all of that try hard, work hard, be connected, help your teammates, et cetera, kind of stuff. And I thought in the opportunities we had a chance to see him play for the Hawks, I think he showed a decent amount of that, which was encouraging to me. So these are guys that, again, won't have a spot, likely won't have a spot, you know, really in the rotation kind of even, even at this point in time, not knowing how much roster change there might be. But if you look at like the kind of guys you want to have in your 12, 13, 14 spot, these are like perfect. You know, they, to me, these are like perfect guys to have in that spot. So from that standpoint, when they became free at the trade deadline, I mean, you know, we, uh, you and I talked a lot about, man, what is this new front office hierarchy going to do? They pounced on that. And I thought that was really a positive move for them. And I think that set themselves up to have some high flexibility here with some legitimate bat, you know, into the bench players who can play for you and not embarrass you, but also have that the flexibility that comes with the contracts they're on right now. Right. And what, I mean, it was something we talked about a lot during the season, but the Hawks had a very stark lack of depth beyond their top nine guys, top 10 guys um, for a lot of the season. And it may not seem that big of a deal. And you could argue that it maybe isn't, but um, not only Sadiq Bey, who we'll talk about, that was the big one, of course, to approve the depth of like even the every night rotation, but like not having to go uh, to this to, to guys you really did not want to have to play if you had injuries. And they, they, there was no chance to really show it because nobody got hurt, which is again a good thing. But, you know, having Bruno as your third center was an upgrade on what they had before. Having Garrison Matthews as your fifth guard, or however you want to say that, was an upgrade on what they had before. Um, my, my favorite side about Garrison Matthews while we're here, and I promise we will not go too long on this, his career – three-point attempt rate, which basically means how many – like so what, what percentage of your shots you take from three-point range? You, you have to have a guess on uh, what that number is for Garrison Matthews, Glenn. Um, so what percentage of his shots are threes? Come from threes, yeah. Oh, man, like 55? <laughs> that would be a very high number. Guess what? <laughs> it's 84.8% of his career yeah. attempts. Come That's from Alan Crabb-esque. Yeah, it is wild. So – you know what you're getting with Garrison Matthews on offense. He's going to be your shooter. He his, he takes, uh, I believe it for, for his career. He has attempted about um, 1.4 twos for 36 minutes and about eight threes for 36 minutes. So yeah. he's going to bomb. Knows um, his role. Yeah. I mean, that's what he's there for. And people kind of maybe have didn't know, you know, it was a pretty anonymous slash bad Houston team. He started 33 games for Houston two years ago. Like he was firmly in their top seven or eight guys two years ago. He played for Washington the year before that and was a big part of their team. And, you know, Hawks fans are like, who's this guy? I'm sure. And that's fine. He's not a prominent name, but he can definitely play. Um, I'm not going to tell, tell you that he's awesome. He's not going to play with Reggie Griffin, but like if they get an injury, sure. And like, like you said at the very top, perhaps the most interesting thing if you are a cap dork like I am is the structure because that those non-guaranteed contracts can be very valuable whether you want to keep those guys around or not. And I'm not, I'll be surprised if I advocate for them to move on from Bruno or Matthews, because they're, they are worth their contracts. That's, those are good contracts. Okay. But if you need to include them on a trade, if you need to move on from a roster spot, protect, you can do that. And that adds some extra value. But I think for now, like you know, Bruno, I, I don't want to say, I, it's one of those questions that we'll probably say for later on too, but I get questions all the time. I'm sure you do, I'm sure you do too. Like what happens if they trade Clint? Is Bruno ready to be the, ready to be the backup center? I think I agree with what you said before. Like, I don't think you want to go into the year with only Bruno and a Kongwu at center. That would not be a good idea. But if something were to happen and you had to have Bruno play 15 minutes a game for a couple, for a couple months, yeah. you'd be fine. I yeah, and as a lot of teams go with sort of a 2A, 2B, where like yeah. one of your backups can like shoot the ball. You know, and you need that for when you need another floor spacer. Luke another guy is more, yeah, exactly. <laughs> another yeah. guy is more defensive oriented, and you can and you can kind of swing in either direction. You know, we we've seen Phoenix. You know, you know, um, Landell, for example, just has a little bit more offensive fluidity, and Beyond yep. was more of that. You know, that defensive anchor. And so there are a lot of teams that go kind of two A two B at their center spot. And Bruno, to me, is good enough to kind of be in a kind of mix and match kind of situation like that. He's a little better than. Most of your average third centers, he can kind of scale up there. I just don't know that I want him playing 20, 20, 18 to 20 minutes a game, all 82, regardless of matchup and all that sort of stuff. That's that's where I think he's not quite there yet. Yeah, we agree. And I do want to stress, and I, I want to get you started on this, but I, I think we've seen enough to know that Bruno is a lot better than he was when he left Atlanta. Uh, that's that's normal. I mean, he's very young. Still, he's only 24 now. But um, for Hawks fans that might have not enjoyed the, the first Bruno era, he's a better player now. He just He's more, he's more complete. 
He's more confident. Um, all those things. We can talk about that more at a later date, I suppose. But it's one of those things where, like, try to remove your early Bruno impressions from uh, from your minds, I would say. Just uh, maybe watch some of the Houston film. Or even when he played for Atlanta, only only a few times did he actually have some rotation minutes. But he was he was markedly better. I think I think I probably said this on the podcast. That last game of the season, game 82, when he played a lot, he might have been the brightest spot of that whole game. He looked, he looked really good. It was, it's, it's, it's one game against backups, but he looked great. I was like, oh, Bruno Fernando. Yeah. How about that? Yeah. Or go watch the first quarter of Hawks versus Houston from earlier in the season. And it, I know it was like – Oh, yeah. The left, left the worst taste in Hawks fans' mouth. But he that was first good. quarter, he was all over the place on defense, you know. And and it, that's something that you want. It's like you're – it, you kind of another comparison going back to like when Zaza played for Golden State, his job was to establish a defense early, and they'd be optional the rest of the, the rest of the game. <laughs> and then that game, the Hawks Houston, and must have been November or December. I don't remember when it was, but you know he set the tone on defense for them. They were a young team and couldn't really carry it on, and there was they couldn't they weren't good enough to kind of develop continuity from what he was establishing. Um, but you know that's just different than what he was in his first tenure with the Hawks, and it really jumps out at you if you kind of. Think about the two examples there. Yep, and uh, a guy who you know had the pedigree to be a top thirty-five pick a few years ago, and he's he has the talent to be able to uh, sort of uh, capitalize on that. And uh, I've always enjoyed Bruno, especially. By the way, everybody loves Bruno. Everybody loves Bruno behind the scenes. Uh, there was a it was not it was not lost on even fans kind of noticed it, but like people like they're plugged in when he came back. There was like a a much bigger. Uh, celebration for him coming back than you would think for a guy who was basically their 13th man. Like people were very excited to have Bruno back because he's a, he's a great guy by all accounts. So awesome. that's helpful too. Um, before we wrap up the uh, sort of the, this, I don't know, I'm not even sure how to refer to these guys, the, the supporting pieces, we'll say. Um, three more guys, and I group these three together too. Um, they're all in non guaranteed contracts, but they're all young players with some intrigue. You have B. Krejci, you have Tyrese Martin, the second round pick from last year, and you have Donovan Williams on a two way contract who. I think like no one's talked about because he was signed mid season and um, he didn't really play any minutes for the Hawks in terms of, uh, you know, on court. In fact, I believe, yeah, he played four minutes for the Hawks for the big league club four, and they were total garbage time minutes. So I get that no one's talking about him for a reason, but um, you know, Martin's interesting. So is Krejci. Like they have some decisions to make almost more interestingly in some ways than they do on Bruno and, and Matthews, who we agree are really good values it's not entirely clear that they're going to keep Vete Krejci or they're going to keep Tyrese Martin. Right. And I don't, I don't have strong opinions either way, honestly. It might just come down to roster spots and flexibility. But um, anything you want to note on these guys? Because uh, you know they didn't play enough to really make an imprint, but Vete was on the rotation for a couple of weeks at one, at one point. Yeah, yeah, he, he was. And, and, I mean, when I watch Vete, it's like he's a guy that I think – when he's like 26 or 27 and he's going to play in Europe, he's going to get opportunity to play and develop, you know, in different contexts and different situations, different leagues and all that sort of stuff. He just, he just is. And that gives him a little bit better of a chance to develop in the player. I think he needs to be to be um, an actual NBA player at some point in time. When I watched him play this year, it's like he didn't care if he ever touched the ball <laughs> and with his size, like that needs to be actually maybe something he's trying to develop as a primary kind of focus for him is the ability to handle and pass the ball. I, I I think his natural ball handling and passing is is impressive. Um but man he is passive and will just kind of just go stand in the corner and not care. You know, uh he has no interest really in shooting the ball as best I can tell. <laughs> you know, and that which is kind of yeah. okay right now because he's not a he's not a you know advanced shooter in any way, shape or form. But I think if he's ever going to kind of knock start knocking on the door of actually being an NBA rotation player is going to come from his ability to kind of create uh at on on the wing as a secondary you know kind of creator that's there and stuff it, and that that's what he has he has a little fluidity he has a little coordination that's just a, a little bit better than what you expect a guy at his experience level and all that sort of stuff on defense the size is going to be everything so he's he's probably going to have to I don't think he'll ever gonna, he's ever going to put on enough weight to kind of actually defend at the three and the four consistently. So he's a guy who might have to kind of slide up or slide up or down, depending on how you talk about it, but to the guard position and learn how to use his length to make up for his lack of agility and ability to kind of contain guards. So that you're never going to have him on, you know, the best you know guard creators in the league. But so he he has to learn to lean into his offensive creation 
kind of potential on offense and then lean in to his length on defense and give himself and his team a little bit of defensive versatility to make that work. There's a lot of work to do to develop him forward into those things. But yeah. to me, if he becomes an actual player, that's the areas where I think he has to kind of really make things progress uh, from my view. Yeah, they, they do like his skill set. And, uh, you know, I noted he was uh, he's an excellent bench guy, bench energy, uh, towel waiver uh, celebration guy. He's fantastic at that. But um, on the court, I'm glad you said the thing about his uh, his willingness to shoot because he actually had the lowest usage, usage on the team. 10.9% usage for me when he played. Now, that's a small sample, but that's less than Trent Forrest. That's less than Aaron Holiday. Like, he, he did not shoot the ball when he, was on, when he was on the floor. And I think maybe part of that was by design. I think when, when he was thrust into play, it was under Nate still. I actually remember the game in Orlando when they had two injuries in a row, and it was suddenly Veet and Jarrett Culver playing the wings, play, playing the wing minutes together in a game that mattered. They were trying, and that was their wing rotation in that, in that game. But – um, I think that they probably wanted him to focus on defense so that he was playable because that was the big knock on V. I mean, I remember talking to people in, in Oklahoma City like about V. Was, everybody's like, "Oh, he's super skilled, super skilled guy. He's skinny, but he can't. He but he can't defend." That's that, that was always the thing about V. And I think he was better than I thought he was going to be on defense this year based on what I had heard about him, what I've seen limited minutes. But I wonder if that was like you know almost coached into him like, "Hey, V." You got to you got to guard and focus on that. Like all year long, if, if you get in there, we need you to kind of tamp down the offense and really just go out there and do your job defensively. Um, that's simplistic, but you know what I mean. And I wonder yeah. if I wonder if that's um, partly the reason why he was so passive because he was he was very passive when he played. And um, there's a skill level there though that they like. It's just the shooting is quite, not quite there. So if you don't have the shooting and you're you know kind of awkwardly um, inserted into that role the results can be a little bit middling. And most of the, most of the time when he was playing on offense, he was kind of ignored and rightfully so. I mean, his offense was not good when he played. I mean, it's obviously a small sample size again, but he was not a huge factor when he played. Yeah. And that's, yeah. he has to, he has to be more of that. Cause otherwise he's not good enough at everything else to not, to not be more of a factor on offense. Cause that's kind of what he was built to be. Yeah. And, and he, and he has a little, a little bit too much to work with to do that. So for me, it's like, I can't imagine him being something you're really interested in in less than like two years time. And the Hawks have to decide, you know, can we give two years to him? You know, is that something we can feel like we can do or not? And that, yeah, to me, that's I'm, that's the evaluation around what it is. What, what your ability to make that kind of commitment or, or not. It, it makes sense that that's the tough one. Yeah, and, you know, not to pile on, I think everybody likes feet as well. I thought there was a chance they were going to cut him when they, made, when they made the trade. I mean, that, that was the trade – um, that was money related. I think money motivated. People probably forgot this by now. It was to shed more Harkless's contract to get yeah. under the tax. That's why they made the trade. And they they, they do kind of like V, no question about that. I'm not saying and that that you, you could see that by the fact that, that they didn't cut him. But they that was at least in my mind, I thought it was was possible they didn't that they would do that. But he has value just as Tyrese Martin does as a very, very cheap contract if you were trying to navigate money wise. And I'm not trying to minimize this um, or them as players, but that is part of the value here is that he was cheap this year. And he's also cheap next year if they want to keep him. Martin's on a rookie minimum, which is the literally the least you can make in the NBA, which is why he was not on a two-way this year. I think I said this before, but I'll just it's not, it's not, it's not a judgment of him. On the vast majority of teams last year, Tyrese would have been on a two-way contract. He was drafted in the 50s. It's a very normal thing to have if you're if you're drafted at that point in the draft, you're usually on a two-way contract in the current in the current NBA. But because he was so cheap, they put him on a regular deal, and that was good for him. But he also was the way they used him all year long was basically as a guy on a two-way. He was in the G League for the vast majority of the season. He played. I'm looking at it now. He played 23 games in the G League as far as like the proper season of the G League. Played a bunch of minutes there and uh, played. I believe it is uh, 66 minutes total in the NBA on a full roster contract, which is that's, that's one of the least you're, that you're ever going to see for a guy who was healthy all year long. So uh, I don't have too much takeaways there. Like I, I feel the same way. I kind of felt about Tyrese a year ago, interesting prospect. It's just that he's not the youngest guy in the world. And uh, he just wasn't really a part of their plan all year long. Yeah. And I mean, some guys don't even get on the two way. They, they get on like, you know, an exhibit 10 kind of contract yeah, and just play in the G league. Right. Uh -huh. So that, that late. So that, that, that was interesting. He did kind of, I might might say kind of luck into, a team that needed the cheapest contract you could find, <laughs> you know. I call that the Milwaukee thing. Bucks, by the way. The, the Bucks are the king of that the last few years because yeah. they've been they always have like two or three late second round picks that they're that they're paying, and, they, and they just never play. The Bucks are famous the last couple of years for just like they're thirteenth or fifteenth on their bench. It's just total wasteland. They just don't. Yeah. <laughs> it's just because they're yeah. trying to navigate the tax, and that's kind of what they did with Martin. 
Yeah, uh, but but for me, he's he's an interesting guy. He um, can handle a little, can shoot a little, um, you know, and uh, and just for me though, it's his toughness. You know, he plays hard. Yeah. He's like he plays with a lot of just aggressiveness, and he competes like every second he's on the floor. And sometimes that's a good kind of uh, first quality to get recognized for for a guy with your first year in the league and trying to kind of look to kind of get established in some sort of small way. Um, and you, you saw that in, in, in summer league, you know, and then you saw that even in times, you know, this season, what little bit you had, you saw that, you know, in some of us play at college park, just his willingness to compete. He's, he's a real competitor and he has just enough skill, you know, kind of mix in with that uh, competitiveness to make him a guy that, you know, you're, you're, I think willing to give him another year to kind of show what, show what you can do. Um, it, you know, his, the one thing that's going to hold him back is he really doesn't move well on defense for a guy who has to play on the wing, right? Yeah. Not big enough really to play at the four and all that sort of stuff, uh, and everything. So, um, and so, but again, like this, like we talked about with V, it's like we talked about with, with like we talk about with other guys is, so that's going to have to come from team defense, help defense, connectedness, working hard, uh, getting on the floor, you know, winning 50, 50 balls up and rebound. You've, you have, when you don't have the raw tools to kind of function in those primary areas of kind of defensive value, it has to come from the, the team defense and the help defense. And that's where it's going to have to kind of come for him, for, for him to make it work. Um, and just more polish as a ball handler, uh, you know, can he run, uh, you know, a second side pick and roll, you know, a few times a game for you, you know, little ways to go there. Um, but, but even like in, in summer league last year, he surprised me. I, his pick and roll game was better than I expected. Nothing mm-hmm. close to what you're going to actually put in your, you know, plan for your NBA team, right. but still it was just better, better than I expected. They, I mean, he ran a ton of pick and roll in summer league last year. Um, and I was like, he's running three times more than Skylar Mays was at the time, you know, <laughs> and, and stuff. But, it, but I thought it was great that you know, Nick Van Exel kind of gave him that opportunity and, and to kind of show what he can do and all that sort of stuff. So, you know, I like him as a guy who's kind of uh, on the perimeter of the league, you know, so to say, even even though he's on a, a guaranteed contract for the whole season uh, and all that sort of stuff, just because I, I like guys who will compete and work hard. But, I, you know, I think he knows where he has to get better and improve to have a chance to kind of really have a chance. Yeah, just so I have the numbers, you know, I, I'll i always be upfront about like, I, I don't watch as much of College Park as I maybe should. I don't have as much, I don't have the time and bandwidth to do that. But I saw him, I, pl- I definitely saw him play a few times in College Park. And I have the numbers here too. If you combine the regular season and the Showcase Cup, which is what their kind of midseason thing is in Vegas, he played 30 games in College Park, averaged uh, about 18 points a game, which is solid. 50% from the floor is pretty intriguing. Shot the ball away from three, 35% is solid enough. I was impressed by this. He averaged almost nine rebounds a game. Yep. To your point about his physical his physicality, you know, Jimmy numbers are often inflated. Keep that in mind. Like the pace is really high, all that stuff. But like that's a that's a good number for someone who's basically playing a lot of shooting guard, playing a lot of sometimes yep. some, some some three. But he's physical there. But the other thing that I want to at least point out is that he committed uh, about a turnover and a half per assist. So he had a negative to start to ratio. That's not what you want for someone doing in that in that role. So. Uh, they like him. He is physical. He is a, for lack of a better term, he has that dog in him. They like the way his mentality is. He plays hard and um, he wants to get better. But I, you know, this is a different regime now too. You know, Travis drafted him. Um, we'll see what the commitment level is there. They might keep him around. They might not. But um, we'll see. It's kind of where I will leave that for now. But uh, at least yeah. at least I like some of the stuff that I saw, and uh, he's well regarded. I know by the team. Yeah, yeah. And then with uh, Donovan, it's just. I, I think he brings an athleticism that's intriguing and interesting, right? That's, that, that's, that's what that's kind his, of jumps out. Of field, I think, yeah, for sure. Yeah, which which I think which a lot of teams will look at that and say, can we develop him into a helpful defender, you know, and, and that sort of thing. And he's, um, you know, experienced. He bounced around his college career, like a lot of guys who played during that time, you know, uh, increasingly more, seeing more and more and more, you know, playing for more than one school uh, and all that sort of stuff. But, but he's just a guy that, um, you know, Again, probably needs two years, you know, sort of like Veet, you know, to kind of potentially kind of become something that you can kind of look at. And say, oh, maybe he's a, a guy we can start thinking of, of, of a, a piece on the on the depth of our bench and, and kind of see, you know, what he might be able to come. But it, it all starts with the athleticism for him and what the defensive potential that kind of comes with that. For me, that's what I see. Yeah, and I'll uh, I don't have much to add to that. You know, he played. Um, actually more than I thought with College Park. He was in the G League a lot last year because he was also in Long Island before he got to Atlanta. He actually ended up playing 32 G League games. 
and shot it better with the Nets than they did with the Hawks. But they like they like his shot too. Like he's just, he's a skilled guy. He's the um, the way that I always put this is like there are almost two archetypes for G League players. It's like guy who can help us now in a pinch, but lower ceiling. Your Shondi Brown types to to, to put a, a carrot in front of you, Glenn. Your guy Shondi yes. Brown, yes. or your Trent, or honestly Trent Forrest types, like yep. guys who you can play right now and they won't embarrass you, or high upside swings. And that's more of what Williams is. He's he, that, there's a reason why he was never really even in consideration to ever play for the Hawks this year. But he's on. But he was also signing the, the multi year two way path. That's that kind of tells you too. Like they, they want to keep him around. He'll be yeah. uh, it looks like around next year too. But he's a long ways off. But they know that, and I think they're taking it easy with him. And we'll see what he can bring. But yeah, that, that, I think for sure his size six six or so, and the way that he can kind of have, he has some burst athletically that guys don't have. Um, so that's that's kind of the appeal. Yeah, and, and the last thing is really is, and you if you kind of track them in college like. And it's never clear, like, is he the guy you really want on ball or guy you want off ball? What is that offensive role? And so they that has to be sorted. I think they have to help him by sorting him, sorting that out for him. Yeah. Um, you'll, you'll see a lot of – you've seen a lot of guys coming through the league, um, you know, that were kind of starting to be like third point guards that are more defensive, like Briante Weber. You know, these guys who are kind of like, uh, you know, really good enough to kind of be on ball, you know, can it be a point guard, you know. And so I think there, I think there's a, a thing to help him with too to kind of sort out like, okay, this is the offensive role we see for you. Let's make that a, a serious input into your development plan and move toward that. Like, is it just a, a small wing, you know, with a lot of athleticism, or are like, no, we need you to have a little bit of on-ball equity. So sorting that out with him is something that I, I would think the Hawks are going to kind of throw into his plan for the summer and even uh, probably have that show up a bit in what he does in summer league with them too. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and I'll just wrap up the podcast now by saying that uh, for the listeners, the people behind the scenes, I thought Glenn and I might do 15 minutes on these guys and it's been 38 minutes. So that's <laughs> very typical me and Glenn. It's going to be its own episode because we can't stop talking about basketball. That's just what Glenn and I do, but I w- we will have much more on other players. We'll probably have standalone episodes on the rest of the roster, but this was on purpose to kind of not diminish these guys in any way, shape or form, but th- these there's kind of a clear divide between the top 10 who are, you know, the core pieces basically for lack of a better term. And then the rest of the roster at the end of the season. So we did that for a reason, but uh, that's why we did that. And then 35, 39 minutes later, here we are. Glenn, please plug yourself for the first time and in, in like at least 10 times in the next couple of weeks. <laughs> Where can people find your work? Uh, you are, uh, as I always say, an ultimate must follow for Hawks fans. So uh, where can they find yourself? Yeah, well, well, for, for the next few weeks or what have you locked on <laughs> hawks is a great place to find me and looking forward to even more conversations and and, and all that sort of stuff but at, at 18 29 with uh, your friend of me as i i'm the only one who says that but i'm going to continue with that with, with kevin over there <laughs> uh, west morton has been kind of jumping in which has been fun yeah, a, lot, a lot of west west has been riding peaster hoops as well a lot uh, yeah it's yeah. good to see good to see west and west has been around for a long time i think you know he, t- he took a couple of years off but uh, west has been uh, kind of an og so i, I appreciate yeah. hearing and seeing west a lot Absolutely. So, you know, it's still a piece of hoops. I'm kind of supporting those guys mostly behind the scenes now. I, my time, I, I can't write me to a deadline me too. right now. <laughs> yeah, I can't write to a deadline right now. You know, the day job and all that stuff is just too much, but I still, you know, enjoy, you know, supporting those guys. However, again, so please, you know, you know, check out the work over there all the time. They're doing a great job on uh, season reviews of players right now, you know, Graham and Wes and others kind of pumping those things out. So, you know, that's a great, just still a great place to be. And I'm still, Plugged in there if you don't see my name uh, on a byline or like that in a while. So that, that that's where you find me. And then at Willis underscore Glenn on Twitter, had a lot of fun in the last twenty four hours of Lakers fans finding my tweet where I said uh, the Warriors were going to smoke the Lakers, and uh, think and uh, Lakers fans kind of coming at me like they they were going to I don't know irritate me. And I just had fun with them. I, there were a lot of like great Lakers fans I've interacted with, and they're like, "Wow, this this Glenn guy's pretty. He's handling this pretty well." I'm like. I'm not invested in my predictions at all. And like a lot of them follow me. So it's been actually been a fun. There you go. When, when you don't, when you're not sensitive about the things you throw <laughs> out there, you can have fun with it. Um, but it's mostly Hawk stuff. It's been a Lakers centric 24 hours, but mostly Hawk stuff. So Hawks fans uh, who I, I, I presume that's the bulk of who's listening here, but you know, if you're not following me already at Will Center Strickland, love conversation and uh, all that sort of stuff. So yeah, find me over there. Yeah, follow Glenn. Certainly highest recommendation for me. Please subscribe to this podcast. Anywhere you get your podcast, we'll have much more on the players and the draft and things are getting uh, 
interesting here in mid-May. So plenty more to discuss. Thanks for listening, everybody. We'll see you all next time.